How's it going, d -d 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 dandies? And welcome back to the episodes that I do. Today we have Audra Burris. She's a childhood friend, voice actor, part time professor, and a loan officer. Audra, how are you doing today? Howdy, I am doing well. <laughs> so, uh, you're going to be the first female bodied person I've had on this show. And uh, so, we might as well start off with the topic of the past few weeks, which is Roe versus Wade. How do you feel about its overturning? Oh, Lord, where do I start? <laughs> <laughs> you know, okay, so first out the gate, it's on its face, it's absolutely heinous. You know, the people that are going to suffer the most are minority women. And, you know, at the sake of trying to parse out the final deep, excuse me, finer details of the constitution, why should those people have to pay? You know, I get the, I'm, I'm no constitutional expert. I get the arguments there. Um, maybe that wasn't the right amendment to tag bodily autonomy onto, but you know, how much does that matter when <laughs> it's going to impact these communities so severely? It, you know, it, it just doesn't make sense to me. Like, are, are we going to change Everything, every time the makeup of the court changes, it's, you know, it, it's just on its face stupid. Although I, I do understand some of the finer point arguments that are there. They don't seem valid to me, if that makes sense. Yeah, for sure. And uh, I, you know, I, I see this as like an omen of things to come as well. Uh, I don't think this will be the first big uh, bad decision that this court makes. So. Yeah, I mean, we'll see. The court has surprised us in the past, so um, who knows? But, you know, as far as Roe v. Wade, it's, you know, the argument I hear a lot is on more of the right side is about states' rights. And I think there's just some things that should be federally legal. Like, the, it just shouldn't really, I don't understand how it's even a state's issue. Like, you know, and there's an argument there, like, let Texas be Texas, let California be California. But some things need to rise to the top. And I would say a woman's right to do whatever she wants to do with her body rises to the top. <laughs> yeah. So it's interesting because the people who really wanted the Bill of Rights to be uh, included in the federal government are the same people who would be for states' rights. Basically, the confederal the people who were supporting the Articles of Confederation uh, were really iffy about accepting the new constitution without a Bill of Rights. And you would think that this would basically be a Bill of Rights kind of issue. Yeah. It's pre preventing the state from encroaching upon people's individual liberty. It's amazing to me that it's even something we're still discussing in 2022. You know, it's just so bizarre. But I, I sort of liken it to um, some of it to the war on drugs and drug use and drugs needing to be federally legal. You know, how many people do we have just rotting in prisons over minor drug offenses? It makes no sense. And yeah, I, I think federal legalization of marijuana is something that the mainstream wants. It's not even politically taboo anymore. I don't even, it's not even. A thing I do, I, I have in the past, but it's not for me. But I'm still just looking at, you know, the numbers. And what's astounding is that it's still not legal on a federal level. And the Democrats have had power and they just can't, they couldn't even agree on it on their platform, whatever that was, a year and a half ago. So it just feels like the whole, the whole thing is so broken. Right. And I know the excuse with Obama was that they didn't want to attach any, like, any more negative, uh, like potentially defaming things to his campaign. But when we get to Biden, what the hell is the excuse now? I don't even understand it. It's there, so, isn't, there isn't one. It, it, it really doesn't make sense. <laughs> yeah. So speaking of politics, you do voice acting, which oftentimes is political, do you want to uh, talk about that at all? Oh, yeah. I love talking about this. Although right. most people, the eyes start to glaze over, right? So I voice a lot of political advertisements, and I voice them all across the political spectrum. 
They don't reflect my personal beliefs. Usually they don't. Sometimes they do. Um, I had to decide really early on, you know, if I wanted to discriminate. And so I just went, no, I'm not, I'm not, I'm just saying I'm just a voice on a thing. It's not my personal endorsement. So anywhere where I have a political reel up or anywhere where I can on my side of marketing and stuff, I try to make that clear. Um, and some people see it as hypocritical, but I just don't. I just think when you fall too far into a political bucket like that and say, oh, this is my personal voice. It's like, you know, when I'm voicing a cartoon, is that my opinion? When I'm voicing an e-learning for a corporation, are those my opinions? <laughs> you know, it, it's not. Most of it's it, it, it's just, you know, pretend. Acting is voice acting and on-screen acting very different. But a lot of voice acting, it's, it's fancy pretending. So... <laughs> Would you say most of the... Uh the ads, the political ads are attack ads now? <sighs> Television? Yeah. I mean, radio, you, you know, it's, it's, if you're going by candidates, I would say it probably leans that way more. Issues can kind of be different. Issue, you know, informational things for regions can be very just informative. I do a lot of those as well. They're not all, they're not all attack ads. Um, okay. Yeah. But there's, there's a lot. It probably just feels like it. Cause I think it's more impactful than something that's sort of like, Oh, okay. This is a fill or fluffy, fluffy yeah. ad. Yeah. It's not, I, I know I am getting for sure. I definitely ignore just about everything <laughs> uh, unless it's what I'm trying to listen to. But, you know, when they start saying, well, Chris Christie, blah, blah, blah. Oh, yeah. Chris Christie, sudden, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. The irony is, like, I never listen to advertisements. I, I just, I, I've i had ad blockers since day one. I don't watch it on, I mean, I don't watch a lot of TV anyway. But, like, just consuming advertisements, I absolutely hate it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They're, they're pretty awful. Um, for a little while, I couldn't figure out how to get YouTube on this without dealing with the ads. Oh. So I'd be in the middle of watching something on the show, and then all of a sudden, an attack ad would pop up. And it would be like <laughs> something about like gay people coming for your kids, or <laughs> God only knows what. And... <laughs> well, it's funny. It feels like a million years ago, but I used to work at a tech company and had co-founded a tech company. And part of some of that was running targeted YouTube advertisements. So I did some of the technical impl implementation on the early days of YouTube pre-roll. And some of that was just money that was just gone through what they call run a network. So it wasn't targeted. So you, you know, be watching a video, which is like, a cooking recipe and then get some like really intense political ads. <laughs> so they've, got, they've gotten better, but I, I try to just zone out when they're happening. I, I do not like paying attention to advertisements at all. Well, I don't, oddly enough, I work in the tech industry and I don't actually enjoy computers a whole lot. Anymore, <laughs> Wait, so. what? Really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. Oh, I'd be, if I could figure out how to replace the income, I'd be doing something else. for sure. <laughs> you can. It'll be this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I remember. Do you remember the early programming days where you'd make the little, you'd write the code and we could go into chat rooms and just like blow it up and kick everyone out? Yeah. Yeah. I, I that's still, I still think about how much fun that was. <laughs> I know. I, I, to me, the internet ended when I could no longer punk people. <laughs> um, so as a, a professor, one of the reasons I wanted you to come on is because you were teaching a really interesting class about dissent within organizations. And uh, I didn't get a whole lot past investigating what that meant, but my assumption was that it was a management class of some sort uh, for how to deal with dissent. Can you, ex or something, can you well, explain? So starting off, I mean, it's a very introductory introductory course. So, you know, starting to unpack even what dissent is takes a little time. So I teach uh, one class and I have students ranging, you know, from 17 to adult learners. So, you know, start very much so at the beginning of this is what dissent is, because some people don't understand that and then applying that within an organizational setting. So it's not necessarily targeted towards management, because it's really relevant 
to everyone in the organization. And I, you know, this, this course is um, designed by one of my academic mentors at Arizona State University. And, you know, the approach is a lot, a lot more, um, it, it's less of having a hierarchy. So it's not really, it's very useful if you're a manager, but, it, you know, we've talked a lot about how do you get this in the hands of, you know, the frontline employer and how do you get, you know, healthy dissent happening in an organization. So one of the things that I get into a little bit further in the course is what's called upward dissent. So lateral dissent would be like if you're complaining to a coworker, but upward dissent strategies, I think, is where people are the most interested um, and how to apply that into their workplaces. So it, it kind of dives in a little deeper. It starts real general and then dives a little deeper into those strategies. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, you know, one, obviously one of the things about having a job is learning how to say no to uh, authority figures and not get fired. Yeah. Um, so what, so what are some healthy ways to do that? Yeah. I mean, it is tricky. If you're talking about more of a whistleblower situation, that tends to almost always be disastrous, right? But for more of a day-to-day person having to execute those sort of strategies, there's five. One is a direct factual appeal. So to really present facts as to why whatever the dissent is relevant, why it needs to change or a solution presentation. So saying, hey, here's a problem, here's a difference, actually presenting the solution. Um, Because sometimes you have facts to confront, right? But you don't have the solution ready. So there's two. And then the third is circumnavigation. So if you're going to circumvent your boss and go to the boss ahead of that boss is another strategy. Um, The most dramatic would be threatening resignation. Um, And then the fifth would be repetition, any of those over and over and over again. So I would say the healthiest ways, the most successful ways are you know, probably bringing a solution to the table um, instead of just complaining about something, you know, having having thought through the avenues of, okay, what do I need to address here, depending on the severity of the situation. You know, there's all kinds of different things that people can dissent about in workplaces, and there's a lot of great, great case studies out there, but it, I mean, you don't even need them because it's one of the things I love being able to relate this topic to my students is they immediately get it cuz everyone experiences this. <laughs> okay, cuz yeah, this is in the communications field, right? Yes. So when I I remember when I took communications, I had to cuz I thought I would get a degree. Um and uh eventually I landed in like a small group communication class and it seemed like really really aimed at being a manager and how to make group cohesion more effective and team building and things like that. And this sounds like it's uh, quite a departure from that. I usually associate communications with management, basically. Yeah, well, it should be there more, quite frankly. It's usually lacking quite a bit. What's interesting is, you know, my um, I had done some consulting And one of the things that I found with doing communications consulting, dealing with leadership in an organization, is leadership sets the tone for the culture Mm -hmm. all the way through. So dissent is a really good indicator for how healthy the organization is, how they handle the dissent, how do they handle those differing of opinions. And the thing is, when you have great leadership and you have great culture, you usually have great avenues for dissent. If you can't fix the leadership and then the culture is toxic and broken, the dissent strategies tend to be more extreme, like we were talking about threatening resignation or people whistleblowing and getting fired or or whatnot. So, you know, it's interesting how the approach, the approach I like to think of it as is like 360 degrees, but really it all comes back to the leadership, the top, because if if they're setting tone for the culture and the culture sucks, that's just going to reverberate all the way through. Yeah, and unfortunately, uh, that happens quite a lot. Yeah, it's 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 interesting how the places that would really be interested in that type of consulting really didn't need it because they had open communicative leaders and would take in feedback and be able to admit when they're wrong. And honestly, I've been thinking about this topic more and more less an application of organizations and just like interpersonal communication because we're seeing, you know, this 
pull of two different political sides getting more and more extreme. Right. And at first, at first I thought that was sort of like media hyperbole. It's like, is it really like this? I feel like everyone I talk to, once you can kind of get into the nuance, agrees more than we disagree, but maybe that's changing. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I think, I think it's changing for sure. What, so yeah. How do you make the bridge from not even like, um, uh, I guess eventually to interpersonal relations, but even outside of a workplace to other kinds of organizations as well, like a labor union or, or maybe yeah. like an activist group or something like that. Yeah, really anywhere where you have a hierarchy, anywhere where you have a, stru- a structure, right? So I also talk about churches, church organizations, um, which are can be pretty powerful and similar to work like affecting your daily life right and there's there's a lot of dissent that happens there too and how do you express that and (laughs) what what are good strategies to do that you can't threaten to resign in some situations right so more of a solution presentation is better in that sort of organization but yeah it's very similar all the way across the different types of organizations you could run into but that's yeah, that's one of the things I've been thinking about more is the interpersonal aspect of it. And how do we how do we take these strategies that are so useful when applied to an organization and take them into like everyone's personal lives? <laughs> like, how do we have better interpersonal communication? Yeah. How, well, how about this? How about have you done any thinking about how it might apply to like an Internet forum? Uh, moderating like. Um, well, what's interesting is that is you have a pretty flat hierarchy, right? You might have a moderator and then just a bunch of people. Yep. So it's like that there's kind of like a king, king of the hill sort of situation. Yeah. I don't I don't know how much of a culture you're going to get there <laughs> that way, which might be kind of good having a like a communication free for all. I sort of like that idea because then the best, most supported idea that's like rooted in facts should always rise to the top eventually you would hope yeah well i mean would you have you've been in like facebook groups and stuff like that would you say that uh that's what happens or (laughs) i would say it would depend on the group right like what is the group that's coming together are we talking about a group of uh i don't want to say anything really mean (laughs) (laughs) Well, say you have a group of people that are just like cooking and they're trying to discuss politics. Like, yeah, you're probably not going to all be on the same page. We have a group of people that already discuss politics that maybe have a thicker skin or a little bit more rhetoric under their belt for debate. Like maybe it's not going to go as sideways. You know, I've noticed anything I've posted politically, um, intentionally or unintentionally, always gets a response. And then when I get the same communications the same people communicating privately, it's very different than the public communication, you know? And I, what I found is it's anything because some of the ads of voice have been very controversial. It's like, you know, the private communications are usually so much more empathetic and understanding than the public <laughs> forum, right? So like this, you're talking about this public forum of a lot of people kind of dogpiling onto whatever. It's like, it's really not a great place for nuanced communication, That's true. Why do you, why, why do you think that is? I mean, groupthink, maybe, maybe just people feeling like they have to conform or maybe part of it that is that performance aspect. Like, Oh, this is very public and people are going to see it or, you know, that's, that's the only thing that really makes sense to me because, you know, I thought about also like the degree of personal responsibility that we all take on. And when you're talking about a forum where someone has maybe an anonymous alias Mm -hmm. or something like Twitter, where, you know, you're getting maybe a heightened version of someone's personality. It's very different from sitting face to face, you know, looking someone in the eye and having a conversation, you know, and that's, that's just a better place for communication to happen. True. Uh, Well, you know where this is going, right? What do you, so... Uh, so do you have any hot takes about cancel culture? <laughs> <laughs> oh, hot takes. Ugh. I don't think so. I mean, I, yeah. it's, it, you know, I, I had said something uh, kind of in the middle of COVID times about that and got a lot of um, 
pushback from friends on the far left saying that there was no cancel culture. And I was like, Oh, I don't think it's kind of creeped into your life life just yet. You know, but um, one of the things I noticed was in 2016, well, when everything happened after Trump had gotten elected, I realized that I personally was in like a media bubble. It's like, Oh, I I didn't even, this wasn't even something I considered as factually possible to happen. So I, because I'm, weird i uh i like deleted all my news aggregate things like i don't have apple news on my phone um and i consciously would go to all different kinds of news sites right so far left middle far right everything and try to cherry pick out okay where is the truth happening and i started to realize how many people just just don't do that and part of it's a time thing right i had the time to do it then but if you don't have the time and you're just sort of in your little echo chamber you're just going to keep getting the same information. It's really harder to see. Yeah, I think around the same time, I actually did that too. And uh, it took me a long time to finally find sources I thought were worth paying attention to. I didn't try to find, I didn't go the approach of trying to get uh, the opinion of all sides. What I wound up doing is going like, directly to what policies were Mm. and just trying to like whatever stage a bill is in uh always know what's coming and being enacted or what people are deciding on there's some really good websites for that but Mm. the more i see that the more i notice in other news resources whether they're on the left or the right how much they leave out it's it's actually really crazy how much uh, is always happening when it comes to legislation that is not really in the news. Yeah, yeah, no, it's it's kind of mind boggling how the news is just a quick flash in the pan. It's the hot take. It's not news. It's it's really not news. It's just the hot take of the day. And you know the new. I don't think I've heard much of media, mainstream media, not alternative media, mainstream media talk about cancel culture or refer to it i haven't heard a lot of that yeah they're getting but then again though. but then again i don't consume a lot of it either <laughs> people like bill maher yeah or, bill maher bill maher would it, uh, wouldn't it be considered mainstream i guess so Maybe. well i mean he's, he's on I hbo he's, yeah so but that's hbo is definitely like you know that's that's a luxury item yeah, right to be exactly for for most americans mm-hmm. so you know, I don't, I don't know. That's not, you can't turn it on and just get it on your TV. But yeah, I, I guess that would be mainstream. I think politically incorrect used to be more accessible though, right? I don't think. I haven't really watched it. I mean, I was a fil- fan of Bill Maher's stand-up and, and yeah. kind of knew of the show, but I don't really remember watching it all that much. Do you think it was more accessible? You're saying it was more. Just, I think it was on a more public network. I think. I like, don't remember. But it was, also, it was certainly more simple times. Because uh, you had you had a lot more people going to condensed news information hubs. This than, was still a time when you could be in a band and do something crazy, and the whole country would uh, would get scared. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah. Yeah. These are different times. <laughs> it, yeah. Yeah. It's it's interesting how much of that splintering is good and bad. And are mm-hmm. we still trying to like figure that out? Like we were talking about, you know, those, those things being broken. It's like, how does that break all the way through? I think the problem with it is that, uh, I don't, it's not entirely whether or not splintering is happening. It's if it's happening, is the splintering real or is it not like, okay, we all go to the same grocery store if we live in whatever neighborhood, well, you probably have two or maybe you have none depending on where you are. But, um, the second you get back to your house, all of a sudden you are in your own bubble of media, right? So that's a false depiction of a reality that's actually more shared than you experience it in your life at home. But then if you decide to turn into a lunatic and go shoot up that grocery store or something like that, uh, you're taking that uh, splintered idea of reality and kind of forcing it on something that's not that way. 
Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, that's interesting because that's I think that's going back to your question about the communication in the group aspect like that. Like why why is the conversation not good? And that's sort of a similar bottom there where it's like, you know, having the expectation that everyone should think how I do or feel how I do or trying to put your view onto the world and the world not being what you want back. I, I don't understand that. And that seems more and more commonplace. Like, you know, wanting, I don't understand this change that the left is going through where there seems to be this desire for more control mm-hmm. coming from the government or from the top down. It's like, wait, I thought this was the hippies and the wild and free. Like what this shift is, is really interesting. That's happening. I, I, I don't, I don't quite understand it. <laughs> I feel like I have an idea of what's going on there. Please tell but, me. <laughs> well, I, I blame, uh, I blame Marxists. I blame, um, the, uh, the past 10 years of, um, more like, okay. Universal healthcare becoming a big issue. Um, civil rights becoming uh, highly discussed again. A lot of the post-Occupy Wall Street discourse became things that should change at the federal level. So the people who wound up becoming like the big voices in those conversations were from NGOs or socialist organizations that aim to change, uh, you know, the big federal structures instead of really specifically orientating towards the grassroots, which the previous since the nineties had been what the left was doing was really focusing on grassroots organization. And, uh, I guess, uh, more micro politics. Yeah. Um, I actually, a better example than the shooter one, I guess for what I was, I think is the way protests happen and their impact seems to be way different as a result of this than it used to be. Uh, Well, the last time I went to a protest was, I think, when Trump came to Phoenix. And I guarantee you that, well, maybe not that one, but a different one I went to, people had no fucking idea what we were doing there. It's like... You go you with this expectation that you're actually going to be like <laughs> raising awareness about whatever, and you wind up just looking like a bunch of uh, idiots in the middle of the street that are just basically an obstacle for traffic. Yeah, I feel like that's what a lot of protesting. Well, you know, I could kind of argue both sides of it, but a lot of it does end up looking that way, and it's a lot of the like, look at me doing so good, you know. So a lot of the protesting that we had here during the beginning of the Black Lives Matter movement in Los Angeles. Um, You know, people are taking selfies out by the police cars on fire, like making sure they're letting their whole social network know, you know, hey, look at me doing good protesting. It's like, and this is, you know, always mind boggling to me that you look at the numbers of the local elections. It's like, no, these people vote. (laughs) No one one votes in local elections, but thank goodness you got that selfie at that protest. It's so frustrating. It becomes like a form of morale boosting just for your own side instead of being having what I would prefer would be some form of conflict, but uh, it's not even a form (laughs) of communication. Yeah, it's it's not even a way of raising awareness because uh, we're already aware. You know, a lot of the protesting that happened in wake of Roe v. Wade, um, you know, on the one hand, I got the emotion of like, let's get out in the streets. On the other hand, it's like everyone is aware I'm not sure that this is really changing anything. And you're just, you know, showing your people that you agree with, like, hey, we agree. And aren't we so great for agreeing? And look at me for doing this. And is that really doing anything positive for the movement? Or is it just a performative thing to make yourself feel better? Yeah, I think it's a bit of an anachronism. Yeah, Uh, the streets, the streets really aren't what they used to be. I mean, people aren't getting on soapboxes and like... Uh, or I like to go to more recent times than that, I guess. They're not, they're not, it doesn't feel to me, and I live in a college town, like uh, teenagers are preoccupied with forming groups that hang out in different parts of whatever the downtown area is. It seems really the downtown areas are shopping centers the way that 
the business has always wanted them to be. Mm-hmm. And kids kind of just avoid it or go there to shop, but they're not like claiming territory. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's not really a contested territory, I guess is what I'm saying. And when protest was effective, I think part of that was you are making a statement about what the space you're in is for. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, that's interesting because at the start of the protesting here, the Black Lives Matter protesting and all of that, when it turned more violent, destructive, you know, the I think a lot of a lot of the emotional knee jerk reaction was like, yes, you know, and then it was also like, but now, like, what is that doing? Who's paying for that? What, like, who, like, I, like, I, you know, I, I think there's something more powerful in staying peaceful, but that's hard to do when you're emotional. And then when you have big emotional groups together, it's not like cooler heads are going to prevail. <laughs> no. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess what I'm trying to say though, is I feel like everyone basically is bought into the idea that the, the common areas are specifically con- uh, commercial areas now. Oh, I see. I see and it's not mean. like we used to make the argument. We, I mean like Phoenix Anarchist Coalition or whatever that, you know, these are supposed to be public spaces for social life to happen, not just spaces to go shopping, but the city only cares about the shopping. So they're trying to prevent, other kinds of socialization from happening. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. Like last, so this is, you know, a few days after 4th of July. 4th of July, two years ago, our beaches were closed here. And I went to a protest on the beach um, because at that point we understood that it was damn near impossible to get COVID outdoors, you know, with next to someone, if they're 15 feet away, you're on a blanket, they're on a blanket, whatever. Um, virtually impossible. We knew that at that point, but that wasn't the mainstream conversation at that point. And the beaches were closed. And I was thinking, I'm paying taxes for all of this to be (laughs) taken care of, right? And it's part of the reason why I pay the exorbitant amount that I have to pay to live here. And this is a a holiday. (laughs) And we can't be down here. So, you know, it's down there protesting, but that it got, you know, it was really interesting. The protest sort of got overrun with people that were more on the right and getting into more of messaging about Trump and this other stuff. That's not really how it started. It was a smaller protest, but it was interesting to see it start one way and morph into something else. And I think you'll appreciate this. So the protest started up on the boardwalk and you have to go down. I don't know how many stairs to get down to the water. So while the beach was closed down there, the initial group of protesters stayed up because they were still, they wanted to get their message out, but they were still being respectful. Like we're not going to go down on the beach and make this a pain in the ass for the cops to deal with or whatever. We just want to, you know, raise awareness that we're not happy about this situation. So as the group of protesters increased and more and more people came out and it became more and more about Trump and American flags and then black lives matter. And there's all kinds of people out there. The group splintered in two. Mm -hmm. And there were people that stayed up and were respectively holding whatever their messaging was. And then there was another group that broke off, went down to the beach, was raising hell down there. So the cops had to come. And it was interesting to see those factions separate. And not too long after that is when January 6th happened. And it made me think a lot about, you know, how did that start and how did it splinter? Like, I'm sure there were people at the start of that day that had no idea it was going to lead to some people being inside of the Capitol. <laughs> oh, <laughs> you no, know? for sure. Yeah. Probably I've most been, Probably most of the people there. I mean, I've been in enough uh, pretty crazy protest situations that I would have never predicted. Where it goes. Well, there was, a, there was a protest here during SB 1070 when they were trying to pass that legislation, which was basically like a um, uh, strict border regulation. Um, Anyway, so the police basically attacked the protest um, and uh, with mounted, they're mounted police. So they're on horses and 
uh, attacked a section that the anarchists were in, but also a lot of people that were not prepared for any kind of like physical combat with, with cops. And they wound up like macing children and like the horse, I think like almost like crushed a kid in a carrier and just turned in a total chaos. Uh, then I was, you know, I've been at protests against the national socialist movement uh, coming to Phoenix and those have turned into actually putting barricades down in the streets and having like throwing stuff at the Nazis <laughs> and things like that. So uh, yeah, I've seen I'm, a lot of other situations, but do you think having the police presence there escalated it? Um, it, it depends. It depends. A lot of the time. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. For, for the NSM March though, I mean, they were basically, uh, I'm not exaggerating, their their job was basically to escort the neo-Nazis to the plaza that they were supposed to have the rally in. Yeah. And um, so they were going to be defending the Nazis one way or the other. But uh, that situation, I don't think, escalated things a whole lot because yeah. it was already going to be kind of pretty combative. Yeah. But definitely at like, some of the more mainstream um, uh, aggravations uh, like the SB 1070 march I'm talking about or just like anti-war protests when cops, they they do escalate. I mean, what, what they'll do is they'll, you know, they'll form a police line right next to, you know, parallel to the the people marching and they'll taunt the people marching uh, the whole way until somebody finally like throws something or pushes back. And then they use that as a pretext for pulling out the tear gas or pulling out the mace or trying to mass arrest people. Yeah. But they're shit starters for sure. I mean, they're not, you know, they could be pulled whatever, but there's gonna be <laughs> at least one cop that's going to like, you know, want to fuck with the protesters. Yeah. I mean, there's, sh there's shit starters on both sides, right? That's just how yeah. it's going to be no matter what, what the issue is. And I, I asked that cause I was thinking, you know, more, even more generally to policing, like let's just have police call them instead of proactively being there. Instead of you patrols. Know? Yeah. 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 I think a lot of the discourse around uh, abolishing the police or defunding the police kind of got um confused by people not understanding the difference between patrols and other functions of the police right yeah yeah i mean obviously you know if there's a murder in your neighborhood everyone's just gonna be like well that sucks no you want to you want a homicide detective there you want <laughs> you want you want the police there to pe people that are experts in managing those situations but you know, do I want a cop to pull over and give me a speeding ticket? No, I know how to operate my vehicle safely. That's why I got a driver's license. That's why I pay to register my vehicle. So, you know, I, I think we're just sort of misusing police right now. Yeah. And another problem with that, too, is police patrols can be dramatically different depending on where you are. I mean, if you're in a gated community somewhere, there's like no police right. anywhere and right. you can't see them. Right. If you come to where I live, you're going to drive two miles and pass four cops. Right. Like, like, yeah. Yeah. Well, there's cops all over where you live. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's College insane. town. <laughs> yeah. 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 So anyway, uh, yeah. Descent within organization. <laughs> no, we don't have to only talk about that. Um, I'm sure as a loan officer, you're seeing some, uh, some, uh, um, concerning signs of what's to come economically. Um, have you been, what do you think? Well, it depends, you know, where you're coming from, what, what you're comparing it to, right? Like we're seeing the highest inflation that we've seen since the eighties, but the mortgage interest rates are about the same. Right. But everyone just went through pandemic rates. So people were getting rates on their homes as low as like 1.75%. And now that the rates are coming back up, 
you know, 5%, someone I spoke to today, 5.5% sounded really high. And it's like, that's actually still historically a great rate, right? So Right. That's what I, yeah, I thought that uh, at least with housing, that it's basically just going back to what it was, right? Yeah, well, I mean, we'll see that the house prices have been higher normally than than normal, but now we're starting to see them soften in some areas. But, you know, like anywhere, like here, I live in Southern California, the prices are just going to be what they are. They're going to keep going up. You live in a popular metropolitan area, it's competitive, that's how it's going to be. But generally across the board, when you're not looking at regionally, yeah, like it'll, it'll I, I, I think the doom and gloom of it, you know, everyone's saying, oh, it's going to be a housing, housing crash. Um, no, mm-hmm. there'll be a correction. But after 2008, federal mortgage laws changed so much to protect from it being a full blown crash again. There's actually so, so much in place to protect borrowers now that didn't exist before. So, you know, I don't think we're going to see some crazy crash in terms of housing. Yeah, uh, the stock think- stock market's a whole other story. <laughs> yeah, that's well. Yeah, that's a different form of speculation. Although uh, the housing part of the stock market didn't. I think I saw something that Redfin was not doing too well, or you know, some of these, the- yeah, a Zillow, like some of these different companies. You know, even when it comes to lenders, like this, have different strategies for how they're going to weather the storm, right? So. I think as a, you know, as a millennial, an old millennial, and millennials are the ones that are being priced out right now of the market, it's um, it's tough. It's definitely tough when you layer on the inflation that's happening right now and everything else that's happening in the economy. But, you know, I, I tell people, you know, maximize your money. You know, it sounds biased because I'm a loan officer, but real estate is always now historically has been a safer bet which is interesting because i was thinking about this today because of our interview here and thinking about private property (laughs) and how how much that those rules apply you know and are required for even what i do every day to exist but you know i don't know that i fully even understand private property i don't think most people do. It's taken it, no. taken for granted. Yeah, and, and then and I didn't even know that there were different perspectives perspectives of private property from anarchists, like some mm-hmm. for some against. Like I, I had no awareness of this at all. So I'm, you know, still yeah, and learning. It, it does get pretty complicated because even even within those conversations, uh, different anarchists aren't using the same. When you say property, you could mean any number of like collection of rights and it could mean like your ability to use something, your ability to uh, still claim a right to it, even when you're not using it, your ability to buy it or sell it, your ability to, you know, there's all there's it's referred to as a bundle of rights in legal Mm -hmm. theory and uh when you get into conversations, I guess on the internet is where I have most of those, <laughs> you know, people are using the term as if it's, it all means one thing to everybody. And it certainly doesn't. Um, and it just gets even more complicated if you start trying to subdivide that between public and private, because ultimately if you look at the, the legal structure, property The only sovereign prop proprietor is the state and every, and that's necessary legally because the state has to be the institution that issues the rights that uh, any of its citizens have regarding this or that asset. So um, we don't, the, the idea of a free market is a very relative term. I mean, it's either more or less free. You're never free of the state, really, because the state is the one that's coming up with all the rights and laws surrounding them to begin with. You know, what's, you know, you can't sell heroin. uh, So there's no free market in that. Uh, (laughs) There's, you know, 
the market in labor has plenty of restrictions. You know, slavery is not legal. Um, and so once you start breaking it down, uh, um, you see that, you know, there's a lot of nuance, like land rights. A lot of people don't really know how the BLM works and how land becomes initially state owned and then auctioned off uh, f- or put into a preserve uh, or give an Aboriginal title, you know, to uh, an indigenous community or so on and so forth. Um, and then uh, the way that zoning works and, you know, a lot of people get in debates about gentrification of, you know, and then if you're in, bring it further and further towards like more anarchist conversation, eventually they're going to talk about, um, property stuff, but a lot of the time they don't talk about zoning and, you know, the whole city is zoned. Usually that's, uh, from the state level and, Uh, The city only adds more rules on top of that. So it's like, yeah, this whole ideology of the free market is more ideology and less reality, in my Mm. opinion. Yeah, it's interesting because you were talking earlier about spaces that were, you know, accepted as commerce spaces at like the malls and downtowns. And it's just like, here's, you know, that's supported by the state. Then you have the commercialism on top of it. And it's where, where are the places that are? Right. Not that. And those are still owned by the state. <laughs> Ultimately, yeah, because they have to be able to. The other reason why is because they have to be able to use. Um, oh, what the fuck is it called? Uh, where they seize property for. Um, oh, holy shit. I just have it. Now it's gone. The. Uh, <laughs> Civil. Um, are you looking at that? I was going oh, to, but I you're can't leaning forward. Like, the, like, yeah, I was going to, and I can't even figure out what to search for. Because um, it's a weird term. And talking about civil forfeiture, where they can seize your property. That's not what I was thinking of, but that's that's a fine example. Imminent domain. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. I, yeah. And so, like, just a, an interesting example of imminent domain, right around when um, the Patriot Act was getting passed. Part of, uh, I was looking into like some of the things it does, and one of the things was that it it gave um, federal agencies uh, the ability to declare imminent domain and use whatever those properties were as like bases of intelligence gathering. So, mm-hmm. if you lived in like let's say an apartment complex, and they needed, you know, to install federal agents or something within one of the one of the apartments in that complex they would use imminent domain laws in order to declare that property uh yeah wouldn't that be against the fifth amendment the I, government cannot make you quarter a soldier right like that seems i isn't part of that though that they need to as long as they provide some sort of compensation Oh, perhaps. I know it's it's complicated, but at the end of the day, in order for the state to even be able to do that to begin with, it has to be the sovereign. And it, mm. so, so is that the? I mean, I get that there's a lot of branches of anarchy, but is that or anarchists? But so is that the the anarchist argument that is against private property? Is that sort of rooted in that idea because everything just ends up being owned by the state and nothing's. Well, uh, the first major anarchist thinker is Pierre Joseph Proudhon and his, his major work is titled what is property. And one of the things he does in that text is he, um, he takes the arguments from earlier economists like uh, and ph- philosophers like John Locke and Adam Smith and uh, Ricardo uh, as to, you know, what morally or ethically gives someone a right to property and sort of like finds um, ways to take their arguments for it and also make those arguments against it. So, for instance, he'll say something like... Uh, if everyone has a, a right to liberty, but everyone also has a right 
to property that's like a basically a contradiction if you try to claim exclusive property because everyone is supposed to have a right to liberty or something like that something along those lines so right from the start um and then he starts differentiating later i uh, between what's called usufruct which is property that is being use used um and what would be called private property i guess would be the capital of someone that's only it's property that's really only being used as an investment and so it's its use is it's uh for exchange right right and so basically he would conclude that stuff like land should you know you should have use rights to it but you shouldn't be able to put it on a market it shouldn't become speculated on and traded um you know, and that would apply to other things people need, but maybe there should be some sort of, uh, you know, the big the big question in history um, is industrial technology and how you craft uh, legal um, codes around its use. And that's really when you start seeing people get really uh, radicalized around property issues, you know, after the fall of the empires, because with the industrial revolution, you know, um, the banks started giving uh, investors enough, enough capital in order to buy up, you know, in order to invest in these very, very capital intensive technologies, you know, like uh, factories and stuff. Mm -hmm. But that would result in everyone having to work for those people, even though they all sort of needed those factories as a society. Hmm. So it's a lot of it is a debate about industrial technology because it's pretty easy to figure out, like if you're in a guild, a society that has like, it's just basically craft workers would, it's, you know, pretty easy to form guilds and, have a more socialist idea of what property should be because everyone basically owns their own tools, you know, their tools of the trade. And as far as materials go, I mean, you know, it's easy to work out a way to distribute materials. But once you get like these highly capital intensive in industries uh, for manufacturing, especially like the first ones were in textiles, then all of a sudden you're you have like uh really centralized institutions that are responsible for producing and distributing goods to massive amounts of people yeah. and that asymmetry creates like property problems for not just wealth accumulation but also um the whole idea that you have this autonomy and your job as a laborer or in society is something that's really under your control. You lose a lot of that because you don't own the tools anymore. The tools are these giant machines that someone else owns. So if you have, you know, smaller decentralized groups that way, right. And you have um, people agreeing on, tools and materials and sharing skills that way, then you have to have those groups agree on the rules of them. Yeah. But Prudhomme supported free contracts. So hmm. it's not a whole lot different there. So you can move, you can move group to group. Yeah. Right. And right. That, that wasn't really the, the big issue. I mean, you know, he, he was in writing about this stuff in the 1850s. So it really was, and in France and in a part of France that was yet to undergo a lot of industrialization. Mm. So he was watching all this happen a little bit at a distance and mostly living in a artisan and peasant society. And the big problem for peasants is that the land that they work uh, is usually owned by an aristocrat or someone else like a king or whatever, a monarch has given rights to that land. And along with the land come the people who work it. And then 
uh, the reason that, you know, the uh, king is able to be so wealthy is they take the surplus that's produced by those peasants as a tax, right? Mm. So the peasants get to live on the land, they have to work the land, but they have to give up the product of their labor to the whoever is given the rights to the land. And then when you get, <clears throat> once land starts being put on the market, that system begins to change because people start speculating on the value of land in a different way and they start buying and selling it when you couldn't do that under the king. Right. And that's mm -hmm. where capitalism starts to come in. So, uh, but the thing is capitalism also comes with a different form of government, which would be, you know, the republic, or in our case, the Dem democratic republic. Depends who you ask. <laughs> yeah. But um, that uh, type of legal system also includes different ideas of what property is. And those different ideas make it possible to speculate on land and its value. And so land becomes a commodity that's traded. And all of a sudden, peasants can't live on it. Uh, you have to pay to live on the land or whatever to whoever owns it. And you... you Basically, this buildup over time of ways of dealing with property rights that get translated to industry. And mm -hmm. because those governments were basically governments of landowners, uh, even in the United States, property ownership was considered, you know, one of the requirements to be a voter, obviously, along with being a man and being white and usually being Christian. <laughs> um so was being a land or a property owner, which usually meant land. And so the people creating the laws about how property work had values that were already uh, informed by their status as being owners of capital. And so they used those same legal frameworks in order to regulate how industrial machinery was uh, how rights were given to the creation and use of industrial machinery. And of course they're given to what might be thought of as an entrepreneur or not. Uh, and they're not given to the workers. <clears throat> hmm. So how would you say Elon Musk comes to you and he's like, Jared, we're going to Mars tomorrow. We get to start from square one. What system do we put into place in all of this land? Although it's not really land, but. Well, I, I mean, I think I would generally think that, I mean, if we don't have a state, that already is going to change a lot of things because. Yeah, say you could start there. It's like, hey, we're, we're starting from scratch. We got land. Just what we're bringing people to Mars and we're not piggybacking any values off of Earth. What's the ideal way to start society? Mm -hmm. Well, it's tough because Mars doesn't have any natural resources that we need. So pretend it's Earth. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Well, I mean, you know, for tens of thousands of years, the way human beings dealt with their situation was not through notions of property because they were nomadic and they would go where the resources were. Mm. And so they weren't, you know, agriculture. They weren't relying on like right, uh, agriculture planes, settled, but, settled us down. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't know what ideal would be, but I know it would be more uh, just for human beings to recognize that, you know, if you're going to cooperate enough to produce, you know, whatever you're producing, whether it's a farm or a factory or whatever, then you should also be cooperating just as much or like the the return you get for that cooperation should be um, relative to that. Mm. So I guess my framework is like, I don't think people should be paid in wages. I think that's insane. Yeah. I think that selling your time is kind of like a way of getting ripped off because you're not being brought into work as an equal for an enterprise who is going to get some percentage of the return, you're being brought in as someone who's 
basically like a second class citizen or something that, you know, you're, you're paid a very specific amount, whether or not the company makes X amount of money. And that amount is usually not to the benefit of you. It's usually based on what the company is going to, uh, the lowest that they could pay you. Right. You know, it's interesting. I heard someone explain this. I can't remember who. I wish I could about the biweekly paycheck and how, you know, a lot of overdraft fees that happen, people can actually afford, but because of the timing when they get paid or whatever, you know, they get hit with these fees. If you were paid every day, at the end of the day, it doesn't necessarily have to be by the hour, right? Like say you just got your lump sum for whatever your goods or services produced were. But if you had money every single day, you were less likely to run into this wall of not being able to make a payment or something and then hit a fee. And then the, the percentage that the banks make off of those fees is astronomical. It basically runs it. <laughs> oh yeah. I mean, Wells Fargo like had a whole scandal around that, right? I thought that was, they were opening accounts. There was that. Yeah. yeah right. They were doing something where they were like, Oh, like if you open a checking account, they're opening a second or something. And yeah, um, that's yeah. what that was. Okay. They're just, I, I they're, think. their overdraft fees just suck. Yeah, and they all, I mean, all fees suck. You know, Wells Fargo had a, they used to have like a banker fee. So if you couldn't, if you had to call to get something resolved and talk to someone, there was like a $2 fee. Oh and um, one time I called and uh, <laughs> I, I don't remember what the situation was, but I explained that I wanted the fee taken off because there wasn't a way to do it online. There wasn't any other way to do it than the way that I did it. And so the person I talked to was like, totally understand reversing this fee. Um, and then I got a fee for that phone call. Stop! Oh Stop! <laughs> Another, it also changes the way you're taxed too. If you're paid bi-weekly or right. monthly or whatever. Yeah. That's another way people get screwed. Yeah. It, it's amazing the way, I think the number one way people get screwed is by not being educated in any of this. And it's something I think about every single day, talking to people all across the country about the mortgages is how little financial literacy happens at all you know i learned things through getting my license saying that i should have i could have learned in elementary school like yeah. a lot of it's not difficult math we're not talking about physics you know this right. is it's money i really feel like money math is very accessible it's not algebra you know you're not throwing in letters and <laughs> like a different it's just it's it's simple things we just don't really get taught yep uh actually that's that's the direction we probably should have taken that whole property conversation was, I mean, you're a loan officer, so you know, <laughs> you're already familiar with this, the way capital works because you have, you're in a position to provide loans, right? Yeah. So, well, the, mind, so the yeah. mindset of a capitalist is you're loaning the, the purpose of the loan is to make a profit. Right. Okay. That doesn't have to be the purpose of a loan. Right. Yeah. No. So, I'm, and I'm not, I'm not a bank. No, no, no. I, I know. I but work for a lender, right? And that's how lenders that's how lenders make their business, you know. But part of that is like say, you know, you have ten thousand dollars in the bank and you want to buy a four hundred thousand dollar home, you don't have four hundred thousand dollars, so you have to pay to have that money to buy that home. Right. Okay, so Unless now, you, you want to just buy a your, home for ten thousand dollars. So the same. I mean, the other. So I guess where I'm going with that is, if you were a investment banker and you had two different uh, people come to you, one of them said, "I'm going to start a rubber band business and it's going to make all this profit. Uh, you'll be able to make your money back." Blah 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 blah. You could charge me high interest. That's fine. And the other person said, "I'm going to start a rubber band company that's going to be a co-op." And we're going to try to not make much of a profit because we want to provide rubber bands to the people. What company are you going to give the loan to if you're a for-profit bank? Right. That you're, well, you know, if you're smart, you'd give the loan to both. <laughs> yeah. That's if you have the, if you have the capital, right? Right. Right. If you have the capital, sure. And uh, you think they'll be able to pay it back. Yeah. Well, I think socially good businesses, you know, I, there's a, I forget the corporation entity it's called I think it's corporation B or something social good is part of the fabric of their mission statement or whatnot. Um, they've increased so much 
And that's something that we know consumers like. Consumers like seeing a business, you know, putting their effort towards climate change or helping whatever issue they touch. It's actually very good marketing. So, yeah. well, you Starbucks, know, Starbucks, right? All of them. Uh, uh, everyone. Yeah. The CEO, I think it was GE, he said, green is green. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> right? Like, if you can, you know, you know, greenwashing and all of that, too. But, like, if you can make something profitable in your business that's having some sort of social good, then market that. That's, that's you know, great business, but more businesses are going that way. But I think we actually will have to have that to overcome some of the obstacles we're going to need to approach as a society in the future, you know, things like climate change issues, which I'm no expert on, don't know very much about, but can only imagine, you know, how that's going to go. Yeah, for sh- of course. I mean, okay. But the reality is, is that co-ops, the number one obstacle they face is startup capital because people don't want to give them loans. But why go to someone that doesn't want to give you a loan? Like if you're a co-op, you say, I'm going to serve this community and all this community is going to be part of it. Couldn't you just go a little bit to each member of the community instead of going to like one oh. big bank, right? Starting more like the, the Kickstarter if, approach. If it's a well. consumer cooperative, that's easier to do. The difference being consumer cooperatives are like, you know, on the retail end of thing, end of the thing where you've got a bunch of people in your neighborhood or something that all want to eat, uh, organic, uh, fair trade, whatever shit. And they are all willing to pitch in money to have, to be part of a consumer co-op that's going to acquire those, those goods. But a producer co-op is a little different because the people with a stake in it mostly are the workers. And, mm-hmm. you know, so if you're producing, I mean, you don't, you're not necessarily in, uh, such an intimate relationship with the buyer. Hmm. Hmm. So you have to find markets, you know, wherever they are. <clears throat> and it's just you're you're approaching it from that angle. So if you want to, you know, let's say I wanted to start my own internet service provider. And uh, <laughs> actually that might, that would probably be easier to do as a consumer co-op. I'm trying to think of a good <laughs> example, actually. <laughs> But anyway, sometimes, you know, especially if you're talking about like machinery that can mass produce way, way more than any one community needs or that the workers themselves need, then you're going to have to like get enough capital in order to get that machinery. And it's not going to come from the customers. Yeah. Well, and I think how much do we really need to though? Well, that's because we have China. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, yeah, we we got rid of our manufacturing. True. (laughs) Yeah, it's a fair point. Uh, (laughs) I was thinking more of like minimalism, but. Oh, oh, yeah. (laughs) Oh, yeah, there is that. (laughs) Some of us try not to buy a bunch of cheap crap from China we don't need. Okay. (laughs) Yeah, I don't know if I'm in that category. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, this is funny. It's kind of going back to the, the voice acting thing. It's like, we're all hypocrites that way, some way or another with what we consume. And so I felt the same thing with my voice. I was like, okay, I'm going to democratize where this goes. Like, I don't, I don't care. Like, I, I know it's hypocritical to a degree. And it's interesting, the attacks that come back. Like, oh, how could you say this or voice that or whatever? Um, like, do you have an iPhone? <laughs> right. Do you know how that gets produced? Like, we're all, we're all, if you're living in America right now, you're a hypocrite in some way or another with how you're consuming things, unless you're maybe living on the streets. So there's maybe an exception there, but. Yeah, actually, I, uh, I used to make a similar argument about, like, being a vegetarian that, um, you should probably try to produce your own food because just of how interconnected all the finances are when it comes to food, like your money probably somewhere along the line is going towards animal abuse. <laughs> right. No, that's, a, that's, there's probably a good argument there for that. And, uh, I think it, 
they've actually been able to show that buying vegetarian products has encouraged um, grocers to, you know, it's had an impact, whereas more vegetarian products are getting bought by grocery stores and stuff like that. But it's also gotten better. Yeah. That's, that's, that's significant. Mm-hmm. But ultimately, yeah, it's like, it's such a tangled web. You don't, to unpack that and to know where your money is going all the time <laughs> is you have to be superhuman to do that. Uh, or, yeah. And, and I mean, or have the time. Yeah. Or even have the resources. I guess we all have the internet, but I mean, it's not really cheap or affordable to just like get whatever shipped because it's the most ethical. <laughs> have you heard of victory gardens? Like in the forties where people. Yeah. Produce, that's, how you the know, front, that's how a front lawn was created, right? Yeah. I mean, it was so, I, I feel like the number was something like 40% of the fruits and vegetables came from Victory Gardens. I might have got that, but yeah, it, it was a significant amount, right? And then all these laws came into place about how to do that gardening. And now that's all being loosened up. You're going to see more urban gardens and community gardens and whatnot. And maybe we'll see more and more of that. So I'm thinking about the co-op in application to that. And, you know, there's all these different subscription boxes now with food and how that happens. And I just keep thinking about, you know, maybe you would know more about this with the 3d printing technology. I'm like, why can't we print food yet? Why don't we have the Jetsons microwave? um, I mean, and I mean, I've seen the 3d printing of cakes and things like that, but there has to be a way to, cause that that's like, like food, and healthcare, these are the two basic things we're talking. Like you take aside the consumerism products and all those things that we're talking about. It's like, how do we, I think everyone has the same goal of like, how do we get like a baseline of society where you don't have to have the slave wage worker like you're talking about. So it's like covering those bases covers quite a bit. It seems attainable. Yeah, it's, it, it does until, I mean, it's like the problem with robots, right? You know, or automation, which is, uh, on the one hand, it could, you know, um, eliminate jobs. On the other hand, uh, that's not such a problem, except for the fact that usually only a tiny number of people are going to be the owners of those robots. Right. <laughs> like, if they were nationalized or if they were owned by the community or something instead, you know, it would compensate, but the only people benefiting from it are going to be the owners of the robots. Well, if the owners of the robots are altruistic enough, why is that bad? I don't, I guess that's what I'm saying. The incentives are perverse. If you're, (laughs) if you're, uh, if the ownership is for profit. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I'm still thinking about the 3d printing microwave. (laughs) I think they do. I think they 3D printed a steak or something. I saw a 3D print of a cake for sure. A cake? Cake, yeah. steak. <laughs> no, it was a wedding cake. It was, oh. it was massive too. I was like, what? Why? But, you know, when I thought of more of the application of, you know, that technology being cheaper and accessible and across society, it's like, oh, well, is that going to be attainable? Because then the next thing is healthcare and the next thing's housing. Well, I know 3D printing has had an impact on healthcare. I think there's a lot of people 3D printing like uh, parts. For- well, I was thinking of like access to healthcare, like as a oh. as an individual, you know, not having to be working slave wages and not having to be a worker, not having to, you know, not have or working but not having the ability to say get the housing um, that you own, have the property rights to. Right. Like what are, what are the basic needs that we need covered? Yeah. I mean, uh, the non-anarchist answer is, you know, uh, you know, single payer. The anarchistic answer is, uh, doctors could work for unions instead of working for insurance companies (laughs) and, uh, your health benefits could be delivered by a doctor that's working for you for your collective organization. Do you know anyone that is under the age of 50 that regularly goes to the same doctor? Uh, Yeah, I I, do. I really don't. Oh, (laughs) really? 
Yeah, maybe that might be a little bit different here, but yeah. <laughs> you go to I, 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 yeah. Her, like always? Yeah. Huh. Don't you get annoyed having to write down a different name ever every time you have to put your primary care? I guess no. <laughs> I just put NA. I don't have really primary care. <laughs> oh. Uh yeah. Yeah, I always go to the same one. <laughs> <laughs> actually i always thought that was like a weird argument about like oh i don't know like the, i don't shop around for doctors or dentists or whatever well you can't when you have insurance and you have to stay in a certain network what shopping around do you get to do yeah but i i feel like they're mostly all competent enough until i have something really going wrong and then i need a specialist yeah, that's. Yeah. I mean, the whole system is based on you know triaging like the least uh, you know demanding patients uh, into like general care, and then sort of escalating to higher levels of specialization. So, I feel like people talking about like how important their doctor is you know, their particular doctor compared to some other one is a little hmm. uh, insane. Yeah, unless you're needing a specialist. Right? Like a heart surgeon. And then, all, yeah. you know, yeah. and then it becomes more of an issue. Like, okay, we want the one that's getting paid a lot. <laughs> Especially now with how much information is available online. I'm sure doctors hate hearing that. But, you know, that is true to a degree. Yeah, there's a lot of diagnostic stuff that I don't, think requires a hell of a lot of like uh skill anymore oh yeah a lot of ai you know is pretty accurate at diagnosing off of scans more so than radiologists or anyone that yeah. looks them over they've seen that time and time again in different studies right i yeah it's just it's another that's another issue that i that's been so politicized that it's hard to get to the nuts and bolts of it and uh you know, I don't the uh, like it just the conversation doesn't seem to go very deep into what medicine even is and what's considered uh, like is chiropractic medicine is psychiatric care medicine is, you know, what when we say single payer, what are we talking? Are we talking dentistry vision? Yeah, I don't <laughs> I don't know who thought that like teeth and eyes were not a part of healthcare, but that's just ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. Someone said, uh, some, I forget who makes a joke about like, you know, anything below the neck is fine, but once you get to the head. <laughs> get here. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's, that, that is right where the line is. Mental health, eyes, teeth. Yeah. No, this isn't that important. Yeah. I know there's like a really intricate history about like, um, the way licensing works for whether you're an MD or you're like a osteopath or whether you're this or that. Mm -hmm. And especially with, I was reading some book on the history of chiropractics and like some of the struggles that um, chiropractors have had to go through to get licensing established because they had this big fight with the, uh, um, uh, allopathic you know basically mm -hmm. what we think of as doctors do you go to uh, a chiropractor the, huh do you go to a chiropractor no oh, okay <laughs> i did but oh. uh i turned out to uh, fall on the side of this is bullshit <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> i was gonna say <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah but anyway there is i mean it's not just mm -hmm. like Someday that, you know, once upon a time was born a medical board with all seeing vision into, into what counted as legit medicine and what was, uh, what was, um, snake sauce or whatever. Snake sauce. Snake oil. Snake oil. Yeah. It was yeah. a pretty like tumultuous process to establish boards and hmm. same with like law stuff. Right. I mean, anybody could become a lawyer at one point. And then the bar association formed and yeah, you know, I uh, have a friend who's an attorney that just constantly complains, not constantly, but you know, frequently it comes up that 
the bar isn't really necessary. Mm -hmm. I mean, so you're really good at taking that exam. How does that even apply to law and the day-to-day -day rigors of the job? It, it doesn't, you know, it really doesn't. Actually, the, the, the tests I have to do for my licensing are more applicable to what I do every day than what the bar is to an attorney. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the history, it's, we, I mean, that's another thing that we just don't, you don't think about it until you're confronted with it, but the history of licensing and stuff like that is not that old. Like, no. it feels like it must have gone back to like, uh, you know, the time of the wigs or whatever, but <laughs> no, it's like less right. than a hundred years. Yeah. I mean, similar with taxes. Yes. We didn't always pay taxes. Well, I mean, kind of. Well, kind of. Paid it not, to England. Not the way we do now. No, I mean, income tax for sure. Yeah. yeah. There's, there's usually, so there's like this, um, like there's this whole line of reasoning, which is like, voting and taxes should be sort of related in some way. Like if you're paying so. taxes, you should be able to vote. Shouldn't everyone be able to vote? Well, <laughs> uh, I'm not a fan of our system one way or the other. Do, yeah. I, do I believe in universal suffrage? Yeah. I mean, if... I don't. I don't want to go back to you need to own property in order to vote. But that oh, was. No. But that was the um, sort of the logic. Like, you own property, you're paying taxes. Therefore, you should have the right to participate in the legal system. Yeah, we've talked about this before with voting. Where you know, because I I was like, did I pay taxes? So I vote. You know, right. I heard someone liken it to like getting a lottery ticket, not checking to see if you won. It's like, oh yeah. You paid, so you may as well participate. <laughs> yeah. Uh, as, right. Or if, I mean, as long, <laughs> it sort of doesn't matter a lot of the time if you vote. Well, but, I mean, on a local level. Right. Y yeah. But those numbers are always significantly lower than people turn out for national elections. And even national issues, like we were talking about Roe v. Wade, it's like, you know, these, the, the the day-to-day -day of your life is so rarely affected by those issues, but then something like that happens and it's, you know, the argument on the right was, well, you know, if you don't, you live in X state and you want to go to Y state for an abortion, you just go to Y state to get your abortion. And I just kept thinking of all the different pundits I heard saying that, like, what a insanely privileged position to have to say, oh, just go to this other state and pay all this money because you can afford to do that as a single mom working three jobs or whatever the situation may be. I mean, there's really just no argument that I've heard that made sense for that. No, fuck no. <laughs> um, have you ever met anybody that knows not only the Constitution, but they know their state's Constitution and they know the Constitution of like their city or something? Very few. I, yeah. can count, I can count on one hand <laughs> those people, but you know, those, I like those people. <laughs> yeah. So I couldn't tell you much about the state's constitution, but what about the city the or municipality? City, I could tell you a little bit more about the municipality, but I I'm pretty involved. And that's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm, in, I'm invested. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Uh, so what else, what else are you working on, Andra? What's going, what's oh. going on? Oh, what else is going on? I always have a million things going on. <laughs> what's rising to the top right now. I mean, we talked about a lot of the, the work that I do. I think like academically, we were talking a little bit about dissent being applied to cultural context and interpersonal context. And I think that's something I've, <laughs> been brewing on for a while but I've started writing more and I don't know what that's going to shape up to look like but you know going into 
2024 and how it applies to politics, I think is really interesting, but there has to be, has to be more marination on that topic. Yeah. All right. Fair enough. <laughs> We're not there yet either. So. <laughs> Um, okay. Well, we're almost at an hour and a half. Do you have any uh, any websites or social media or anything you want the audience to know? Yeah, about? all all of my websites, social media presence are the same. Audra Burris, it's my name. Very simple. I have a lot of different things that I do, but I'm just me. There's no branding. All right. Well, yeah, I'll make sure to include all that stuff in the show description. Sweet. All right. Uh, <laughs> Sweet. Well, let's have you on again and talk more stuff. There's always sure. stuff to talk about. So, Anytime. And, uh, it's my pleasure. All right. Uh, bye bye, dandies. Peace out, Girl Scout.